Okay, so this is a retreat, retreat, and one of the things that the leadership team suggested we talk about is unity. So way back in the dark ages, uh, year 2000, um, we just weathered another attack by Satan, and uh, trying to figure out, well, what do we do? And we had a guy who kind of two weeks previously had taught about the church and its importance, and then two weeks later said, I don't believe that anymore. I don't, don't know what I believe, but I don't believe that. And he had got around a guy who uh, was actually pretty famous who said, the church is just when you have two or three people gathered in his name, so that's church, there's nothing else. Well, in Matthew 18, Jesus said, you know, two or three gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And it was in the context of church discipline, but it really wasn't defined in church. This is a lot of data in the scripture about what a church is and what it's supposed to do. So I did this, I've done this on a couple topics, and uh, you might be able to find them on Truthbase, and maybe I can uh, resurrect some from my hard drive. I put together a study guide on church. So this is stuff on church. These were questions, and I asked people, most of you have this in your inbox. If you don't, send me an email, and I'll send it to you. Um, I asked people to go study it, and then we got together each week. First week, we went over the questions in depth, and then the second week, um, I gave a summary of them. So we're gonna look at one of those summaries a little later, part four. But uh, these are some of the great questions, and I'm sorry I'm gonna have to page through this pretty fast. Uh, I even gave people some, um, so those questions get answered, some help, you know, Strong's numbers, I looked up the word church. You can do this far, far easily on your own. And I threw in some other verses. Uh, this is a uh, big example of what you'll find in the online Bible. And we got a whole bunch of verses. Oh, there's Hastings Bible Dictionary. So it's always good to look at these things to kind of get a picture. And we went on and on and on and on and on and on and on. I guess there's a lot of stuff. Um, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are really worth reading a lot. Does anybody know why? What's in 2 and 3? What is the churches from whom? Jesus. Really? He writes letters. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, he, if you've read these, you know that he evaluates the churches and says, oh, you guys are doing good in this, you're not doing good in that, and then he commends them where they're doing good and really lambasts them for where they are not doing good. And people need to understand the resurrected Christ it will come back and judge not just individuals but also churches. And one of the things that he particularly gets up people's case for is what the church tolerates. And in order to be able to uh, act with any certainty and authority on what the church, Christ wants, you have to look at what his word says about it. So there's some good stuff in there. I encourage you to look at that. This is where we actually got together, and uh, this I think is worth referencing based on your church building activity yesterday. You guys built churches. And the church in the New Testament is called a temple. As Peter says, we are dwelling into a habitation of God built together. Your royal priesthood, the imagery there is surely that the church is a temple. And what happened in the Old Testament temple? What, what was the significance about that? For God to dwell. For God to dwell. Did he need a place for them to meet? <laughs> so remember what happened? He had a group of people. He brought them out of Israel. He redeemed them. Remember that? Through the blood, made them believers. Took them through the wilderness. Got him to Mount Sinai, gave them instructions, and then a little later he gave them instructions for building the temple. So the first instructions were to clean up their moral lives, the second group of instructions were to how to build the temple. And there's a lot of them. You guys all know the socket and the this and the that and the silver and the badger I mean, yeah, who would build something like that? Actually, lots of people still do. Um, they give their lives to reconstructing the temple. Well, and then the thing was, if you look at the book of Exodus, Exodus, beginning of the uh, book, starts out with him taking the people out of Egypt. Then all through you've got instructions, and then at the end the temple gets built, and what happens? What happens at the end when the temple gets built? Oh. Boy? I, I, I was thinking farther down the road. The glory, comes, the down. The glory yeah. comes down and the Lord builds his temple. So big picture view of Exodus, God redeemed his people, bring them together, put him, you know, gave him some instructions so he could dwell with his people, so people would know that is the spot where the triune God dwells. Not the God of that mountain or that stream, but the, the creator God. And what happened at the temple? We get a little further down. Sacrifices. Sacrifices. And what kind of sacrifices were 
probably the most commonly offered. Blood. Yeah, blood. Sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise. People would come and praise God for what he'd done in their lives, right? <laughs> did, does anybody have any non-Dory memory who remembers what we did an hour ago? <laughs> we praise God for what he did in our lives. Was anybody encouraged by what God did in someone else's life? Yeah. Did anybody actually listen to one of those things and said, oh yeah, I, could, I should do that a little more? It, it, it praise done correctly is incredibly edifying. It builds you up to become, you know, a praiser of God. And then jump fast forward to the New Testament. By him, therefore, let us offer a sacrifice of praise to God, fruit of lips that confess his name. God did this for me. Let me tell you about it. So Old Testament temple, New Testament church. So uh, the New Testament refers to the assembly of believers, the church as the new temple of God. It's where his glory is seen and faithful believers are edified. You know, this was written decades ago. We just did it yesterday. That's the, that's the plan. It's, I'm really gratified to see that the plan is working. Similar to the Old Testament temple, an unholy church defiled by the presence of willful sin hinders God from being present and glorified. That's why the Lord threatens sin-tolerating churches of Revelation 2 and 3 with the removal of their lampstand. The Holy Spirit, take them out. Because defilement by tolerated sin prevent his glory from being manifested. Uh, hard words, but they come out of both those things. So, church, why does it exist? Uh, you guys, we talked about that earlier on Mac, you know, our brochure level. We looked at different forms of church leadership and all that stuff. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that, which goes back to that one, um, and if, if you're reading through the study guide, the first part is uh, a blurb on the thing. I mean, it's, here's the questions to go study. The second part is go study it. And uh, so this really should be A and B. So uh, what's the purpose of the church? Yeah, we just did that. This was the uh, follow-up to the first study. Okay, then we get to our guy down here. This should be a new page thingy. Let's see if we can do that. Should be a new page thingy. Oh, it's not the page settings. Ah, there it is. Okay. Now i got to get that attention for the top. There it is. And this is under what is a uh, or the church supposed to do? How do you see the New Testament carrying out that purposes? So I know you guys can read. Um, if I let you read this, then I wouldn't have anything to say. <laughs> this is why... Bad professors read textbooks because what else are they going to do? But it states it the way that I think is uh, worth repeating. So Jesus brought the Father glory by obeying him. Does anybody know the verse that comes from? Chapter. It's in, your work. It's in John, right? John 17. Yeah, I've completed, I brought you glory by completing the work that you gave me to do. So one of the things that you eventually want to be able to do is if you see a concept, you're able to relate it to the scripture. So, work on it. Eric's got an app that's coming out to help you. There's an app for that. Uh, um, so, we corporately bring the Father glory by obeying his instructions for the church. Why is it important to bring God glory? Purpose for existing? It's our purpose for existing, yeah. And then, you, you can tell that based on Isaiah 43, 43, yeah, then before 53. Twice in that he talks about that. There's a page and toil on it. And um, you can also infer that from 1 Corinthians 10. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of yourself. <laughs> no? Well, how's, it, how's it go? For the glory of God. I, I knew it was something like that. Yeah, right. Okay, so we want to do it for the glory of God, which is him looking good in the eyes of others. Where's that come from? Sermon on the Mount, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we do things to make God look good in the eyes of others. Make sense? So, we corporately bring the uh, Father glory by obeying his instructions for the church. Who's head of the church? Jesus. Jesus. Wait, that's one, two times that's a correct answer. <laughs> um, he communicates... <laughs> 
Chocolate? <laughs> Close. Uh, he communicates his will for the church through his Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit communicates God's will through the Word, objectively, in direct commands as well as principles, this the will of God stuff, and subjectively, when the occasion warrants. Okay, so there's this whole thing. So I, I do this, I don't think it's coming up later. But uh, it's under the church structure, but it's a good thing it's worthwhile knowing. So the principle is, Jesus is the head of the church, he's got a will for the church, he communicates that will. Okay? He communicates it through his word and his spirit. Now, in various churches, there are different forms of church government. Um, some are very hierarchical. You got a pope or a patriarch, and you got bishops or cardinals or bishops and priests, and you know, then you then you got people you know, way down. Um, others are the exact opposite. They're congregational. Oh, we're all one, and we'll just you know. So that's big New England, the rugged individuals of Americana, rejected any uh, ecclesiastical structure, and it's just like we just gather a cultic offshoot of that are the friends meetings, where they have this thing called dumb readings, the look of the scripture, and they call them dumb because you're not supposed to comment on them. You just read it, and that's it. And then you really focus on the inner light, whatever you happen to be feeling. And this a group of the friends became what's known as the Quakers, because as they were getting possessed by their spirits, they would quake. And then they would have utterances, and people say, oh, that's God. But that wasn't always the case. Okay, so in between, you have bunches of you know, semi-hierarchical groups. Um, you have some that are run by a bishop, who friends would fit in that, as opposed to a pope. Um, then you've got things that are run by a group of elders that are called presbyter presbyter Presbyterians, but it comes to the Greek word presbyteros. Uh, and then you've got the Baptists that are run by pastors for the most part. So you have these different groups of it. So which one is right? Well, you grew up in a certain tradition, obviously, that's right. But, but let's think about it. So, a missionary gets sent out or goes out, or gets dropped in the middle of a jungle by a plane, and uh, starts translating scripture, sharing what they're about, and people become believers. We now have a group of believers gathered in Christ's name. God is in the midst of them. Are they a church? Yeah. More or less, they're gathering in the name of Jesus for pleasing Jesus, yeah, it's not bad. Um, okay, how is the Father going to communicate his will to that body of believers? Do you think? His word, but we don't have all the word translated. The people don't even know how to read. Um, they've just been saved last week. <laughs> what? Basically, the missionary. You know, yeah. He's the one who best knows the scriptures and the spirit. So he's the one who's going to guide it. Then, say, the body matures. More and more people understand the word of the scriptures. So then you can move from a more you know, hierarchical or Baptist model to a more elder-run model. Because they have a group of people in whom the word of God is dwelling richly. Ideally, you'd move to a congregational model. Congregational model is when every believer is in touch with the Holy Spirit, uh, submitted to Christ's headship, and equally mature. Does that situation ever exist? Never. Why not? Because new people come in, and then it just messes up the whole thing. So the trick is to not let new people come in. Keep them away. <laughs> so we can be a perfect church. No, you don't like that one either. All right. Isn't the whole disciple thing? I mean, you kind of need new people. Yeah. 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 So, like, you gotta ask yourself which you want more: structure or disciple making. So Paul said he preached Christ, and then he labored, admonishing and teaching, admonishing every person. Gets emphasized and teaching every person to present every person mature in Christ. A lot of churches just say, we'll, we'll preach Christ. But it's not just the general thing. That God's plan is for every member of that body to be part of the body, contributing to the body, and causing the body to grow. One of the instructions you got yesterday was in Ephesians 4. What was the goal? 
Christ is the head. Every part of the body is connected to the head and each other by the bond of love. And then they all contribute to the growth of the body for perfecting itself in love. What's the essence of love? Caring what's in another person's best interest. Yeah, other centeredness, caring what's in another person's best interest. So the only way that you can really attain that is if a person gets their needs met by God out of the relationship with God, so they're free to meet the needs of others. That makes sense? So when you have a person who's just concerned about themselves, do they look to anyone else's needs? So when we tell them, oh, you need to look to others' needs, they'll say, <laughs> because what about my needs? Who's, who's going to meet my needs? Well, God meets your needs. So we have to help people learn how to have God meet their needs so they're free to meet the needs of others. And yeah, that's you, you kind of see that model in the life of Paul, Timothy, Titus, Epaphroditus, and a bunch of guys that were in the New Testament serving others. So once you have that dynamic going, you can then... Do you think a group of new converts are unified? Yeah, they just, they all have their own agenda. So you have to basically align their agenda with Christ, and then the Spirit of God guides as the people fit together. So, there it is, got it. <laughs> uh, they fit together so that God can dwell in a thing. Here's the church, here's the steeple. Wait, this way. Here, here's the church, here's the steeple. Open the door, see all the people. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nursery rhyme, guys. If you didn't get that, you were deprived. Okay. Um, so what else do we have here? Okay, so there are commands to be unified. You, you did see them on that sheet. You looked at that sheet. Mm -hmm. And you want to actually figure out how can we cause our body, and we have a number, a lot of mature people here, to have the kind of unity that God wants us to have. So I won't mention any names or groups, but there was a group yesterday that uh, was trying to build a church, and someone gave them a genius bag and a bunch of instructions, and said, you know, read the instructions and figure out, to pick out the top five and use them to build the church. Well, as we split up the groups, unfortunately we got a whole bunch of J's in one group, and I, I was watching what was going on, going on there, and there was one person, I think it was the perceiver in the group, looking at the verses trying to figure them out, and everybody else built the church. <laughs> Then they thought, okay, uh, now we have to basically sell this as being a biblical church. So every thought that person had about what would go with a biblical church, uh, that said, okay, now we got the church. So it was a little backwards. Unfortunately, people had some good biblical ideas. But what's unfortunate is in most places in the world, people's ideas about the church are not biblical because the people aren't biblical. They don't understand the scriptures. You know, trust me, I, I read what people write who are supposedly representative of folks who understand the scriptures. And if you can do Bible study, you begin to realize, I, that, that, that's not what it says. So they don't know what's going on. So they take a group of their ideas about what a church should be like, which are largely shaped by the culture, and then say, um, okay, we're, we're a good church because you know we're doing what we think a church should be like. And I would always encourage people like that to take a look at Revelation 2 and 3. See what Jesus thinks of your church. That should really determine what our church is like. It summarizes all the stuff that Jesus was, you know, about and the Holy Spirit was trying to get communicated through the epistles. And uh, Jesus gives them the test at the end. And most churches in Revelation fail. And I would think that is really the case today. Uh, there are times in history where the church has been decent. Uh, the church has gone more and more away from Christ and into the culture. Um, and that's kind of unfortunate because now God's glory is almost uh, extinct. God is uh, not afraid to actually extinguish his temple and his church. He did it in the Old Testament times, burned the most magnificent building on the face of the earth that was made for his glory, that he provided for and he built it and he just burned to the ground. Unbelievable. That, that act of God doing that is like mind-boggling. He could have at least rented it out. <laughs> back to seventy years later, but he's and unfortunately, I see in our country, and uh, I usually don't get this uh, preaching, but I see our country is headed in the same direction. It's, it is abandoned God, and as I mentioned in one of the sermons a couple weeks ago, Solzhenitsyn said, "Why was Russia having such a hard time when they were getting persecuted for communism? Uh, it looks like God had abandoned them because Russia had abandoned God, and I think the U.S. is you know, definitely in that queue." 
So to forestall the inevitable um, and as an outworking of our faithfulness, uh, we will build as God commanded us because that is what he wants us to do and he'll bring us, give us glory if we do our attempts to bring him glory. Question comes up, what is biblical unity and its purpose? So understanding unity's purpose as well as specific mandated practices in the New Testament can help us define it. Jesus prayed for our unity or oneness and you might have noticed in some of your verses there was a whole lot of stuff on unity, one-mindedness, stuff like that. The incredible standard is in John 17. Jesus' last you know, full uh, communication on earth uh, that we have recorded for us. And he prayed that we would be one as Jesus and the Father was one and in case you missed that, a little later on, he says that they may be perfect in oneness, whatever that means. Uh, so let's kind of take a look at what kind of unity are we supposed to have that is reflective of the unity that Jesus and the Father have. So the, the long way, you're going you're gonna to have to answer this, so be thinking. The long way is you go through and look at every single one of Jesus' interactions with the Father when he prays, when he mentions this teaching from the Father. He talks all about that. You get an idea of their relationship, and then you can more appropriately address it. But for now, let's just talk off the top of our head. What kind of unity is it that reflects that Jesus and the Father had? What, what hallmarked it? What characterized it? Submission. Submission. So Jesus submitted Father, great verse on that is what he prayed in the garden right after this, uh, uh, not my will but thine be done. I, earlier he said, I can't do anything unless the Father tells me. I've, I've come to do his will. So that would be good. It's extreme unity because he said, I am the Father and the Father is in me. So just just be one. You you see one, you see the other. No. Right? That, that's like, that is extreme. Was it a physical unity? Yeah, it's too, om too omniscient, omnipresent beings. I mean, there's going to be some tightness there, you know. But but the Father wasn't having Jesus on Earth, so what kind of what other unity do they share? Like-mindedness. Like-mindedness, and how would you expand on like-mindedness? Help Brad, but you you can come up with one or someone else. They have the same vision, same values. Same vision, same values, same Koch brothers funding them, same. <laughs> Oh, city joke people. Um, <laughs> but they have the same vision and values, the same purpose, the same objectives. Do they get in the way of each other? No, because they. So I think of a world class uh, a, a soccer team in the World Cup. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you look at them and compare them to a group of third graders, okay? We're going to have the Dutch soccer team face a group of third graders in America. Watch out. Who's going to win? The, the third graders, because the Dutch are so nice that they really like everything. <laughs> 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 what type of football are playing here? I'm with you. Well, the parents would actually come and sabotage the <laughs> Dutch team. Oh, yeah. This, oh, yeah. this, Hell no, no fury like a scorned soccer mom. Um, <laughs> you know, they would get totally destroyed. But, but why? If you looked at the manner of play, what would you see the third graders doing? Swarm ball. Yeah, swarm ball, very good term. Yeah, everybody's going after the ball, their thing, I want to get the glory, I want to kick the ball. Oh, I want to kick the ball, I want to kick the ball. You know, you kicked it the wrong way, Samson. You know, it's like, <laughs> but I got to kick it, I got to kick it. You know, so the, each person is living for themselves. It's not a coordinated team effort. Well, if you look at the Dutch team, and every time I look at soccer, I kind of watch the people run around on the screen thinking, what are they doing? But they are actually running into a position. They've got a strategy they're working on. There's a guy like way over there, but the ball's over here. But he's waiting out there. There's a guy way back there, but the ball's up here. But they are each playing a part, all coordinated efforts that come together to cause the team to win. Another analogy that I think is really appropriate is a military team on patrol in the jungle during the days of Vietnam when there are snipers out to kill them and there are booby, uh, booby traps and minefields and all that other stuff. 
Does everybody just kind of wander through the woods on their own? No, it's a purpose. There's a getting keep coming each other's back. If a guy gets wounded, we leave him behind. No, we don't. No, we, we defend him, we build a perimeter. You, know, you do all this stuff for the objective of the team. And when the team has a mandate, we want to go up the hill, the other guy says, oh yeah, but the, the view is so much nicer over by that river. That doesn't happen. They all sacrifice themselves for the common good. So that's what a biblical church should really be, where they're looking out for the other guy to such an extent that they have a unity of purpose and intent that is what Jesus and the Father had. Um, and the way I think it, that's supposed to work out in a church is we authenticate belief in Christ to the world. Um, and this is why the world, Jesus said the world would know we are his disciples by the love we have for one another. Where none of us have our own agenda, we always have God's agenda and we sacrifice ourselves for that. In uh, the New Testament church, you guys probably are aware of the fact that they had problems and divisions. What was the major division that would be behind most of the letters in the New Testament? Jewish wanting to bring in kind of the Old Testament sacrificial uh, ceremonial system. The ceremonial system, yeah, basically. And who were the other guys on the other side? Gentiles. Right? So the Jew-Gentile division, the Jews said, ah, oh, no, we have worth and value because like, we have the Old Testament. You guys got to do what we say to be able to be pleasing to God. And the Gentiles are there like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What's this Jewish stuff? Circumcision? No way, Jose. Yeah, so the... Uh, there was a little tension between the two groups, and Paul writes a lot of his letters to correct that. The best letter he writes, the one that is most central to the understanding of the church, is Ephesians. And he shows how God had a plan, uh, bringing both groups together, and unity was part of that plan, and then he tells about how to preserve that unity. And that's where that great verse in chapter 4 was in. His argument climaxes in 521 where he says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And the submitting to one another is submitting to one another in the church accomplishing its purpose. Then, what happens in chapter 6? Satan, Satan attacks. And the armor there is corporate. It's based on the truth that Paul had previously related in that letter. And what the first group of, the first weapon, piece of armor you have, and the last one, what are they? Having your loins girt about with truth, truth taking up the, truth. which is the word, word of God, God, right? So truth to truth, right? That it's, 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 uh, it, it's, you're sanctified by the truth. It's absolutely essential to combat Satan. So when he says uh, the church is mature, they'll be uh, not tossed to and fro by everyone of doctrine, the craft and wiles of men. There's, there's a one of those words is used of demonic attack. And uh, someone once said, and I went and verified it, that I believe this is true. Every time you see the Holy Spirit in the book of Ephesians, he is trying to build unity. Every time you see the spirit of Satan, he is trying to create disunity. So friends, we are actually caught in a cosmic chess match between God on one side and Satan on the other. And in Ephesians 3.10, how many people know Ephesians 3.10 off the top of their head? Not it basically says, we are pawns in this game. It shows Satan that he should disobey. On this sheet that I gave you yesterday, I had a little parenthesis. For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father. And I said, what's the reason? If you look back in the context, that's the reason you would find it. So Paul prays that they would have this unity, that Christ would dwell in their hearts. They would have unity that he could uh, inhabit. So Satan wants to thwart that, and does Paul say in Ephesians, you guys are pretty literate, so you know Ephesians 6, that you should go out and charge the gates of hell with your sword and your shield and your little plastic stuff? No. What does he say you're supposed to do? Stand. 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 How many times does he say stand? Five. Yeah, it's something like that. It's more than three. Lots. Yeah. So stand, 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 stand. Stand what? In the unity that God has created. So God creates people in unity, but Satan causes the disunity. So this actually, as a person says, okay, Jesus, uh, you know, I, I've sinned, um, I accept you as the payment for my sin, 
probably a living life that's pleasing to you, you have a, a, a unity, but then that immediately goes by the wayside as Satan comes in and says, now, guy, you didn't really want to say that. Let's go over here and do the things you used to do because they were a lot more fun than this Christian stuff. So uh, God wants to build a church that he can dwell. Uh, I want to use the metaphor out of um, 1 Peter. Okay, 1 Peter, people, chapter 2. I know some of you have studied it. What is the metaphor there for the church? Body. Body. Living stones. Yeah, you guys, you know, they're knuckleheads, they're stoneheads. <laughs> you know, being a living stone is pretty good. And if you took a stone, and you had, we're also called living sacrifices, kind of a little thing you do, what are believers called that are living? Does anybody know anything about masonry? <laughs> oh, that's right, yeah. You gotta repoint that basement wall, the waterproof it, yeah. It rocks? It's about rocks, yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, How do you get the rocks to fit together? You go out and look at you look at around the world and you find rocks that are shaped perfectly to fit next to this other rock that you found. Nope, you guys don't. You have to chisel them, right? Cut them. Yeah, that's hurts and it's hard and the rock doesn't always cooperate. And uh, it, you know, it, if you think about it, that's probably one of the harder things to do to shape a square rock. You know, you can actually shape a, you know, a figure out of a rock easier than you can shape a square rock. But there are some places that have been built where you can't even put a piece of paper in between two rocks because there's no mortar, but it's just you know, perfectly put together. So that's, we, we kind of have to submit to the master sculptor to have him chip off the parts of us that prevent us from being joined to the one next to us. Make sense? Right? So, oh, wait, that little protrusion there, it makes me really unique. I really like that. You, you, you can't get rid of that, because that's me. Chop, 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 bang, <laughs> it's gone. My, my, my little bump is there. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, it should be, wow, great God, now I can better serve your purposes. So God will chisel us to make us fit, and then he fits us together, and then that's the pre prelude to the glory dwelling within us. Um, so Satan is going to do some things of thwarting God um, by undermining, confusing, and counterfeiting biblical unity. Any questions on this part? Oh yeah, sorry, question. Yeah, sure. Um, did that verse in John 17 apply, I know we're talking in the context of our specific church, but does the verse itself apply to Christians in general? Because I know the prayer is for believers in general. Um, all right, there are two views of the church, church universal and church local. The letters are written to individual, by Paul, for the most part are written to individual churches. He writes a few to individuals, but most of those letters are written to individual churches. He then tells them in one of the letters to read the letters that the other church, and you read the one I sent to them. So when Paul writes to the Corinthians in chapter 12, he says, um, he's trying to give them a base for unity. And he says, uh, by one spirit, you are all baptized into one body. Now, what he's doing is he's using this principle that you guys are supposed to be acting like a unified body, and he's reminding them that there is one spirit that put you into this body, there is one spirit that indwells you, you have differing gifts and abilities, but that is all supposed to be used to the common good of that body. If you look, open up a theology book, and I would suggest you try to refrain from this practice, you'll see that that verse is used as a basis for the concept of the universal church. So, yeah, there is a universal church. There are a couple times where God is referring to all body of believers. But most of the verses are actually relating to individual bodies of believers. And there are people who kind of want to view the universal thing. And then there are people who want to do the ecumenical thing. Like anybody who basically says, we're not a synagogue or a mosque. We're Christian. We should fellowship with each other. And the idea is that um, we're all supposed to be one. And to get that kind of unity, how do you get unity with a group of people that is, oh, I got it right here on the screen. Can a liberal leaning, which 
Liberal means errant Bible. You can't trust the Bible, only the parts that you like, when you like them, but you can always change. Uh, creation is a myth as well as everything else. Again, that, you know, we'll put charismatic Roman Catholic, a millennialist who doesn't believe that there's a kingdom, um, who believes Jesus as a suffering savior and that the purpose of the church is to win the world so Jesus can return, have father, son, unity, that the New Testament specifies, but the conservative Greek Orthodox dispensational narratist who believes that Jesus is the Savior of the world and that the purpose of the church is to glorify God by faithfully making prospective disciples, and then he's coming back to judge good and bad believers. What kind of unity are they going to have? Something about Jesus. We're not sure what, because we don't know who Jesus is in one camp. You know, so it's like, how can you have unity with these people? Yeah, you can agree on an objective. You know, this always happens in political times. Um, somebody was telling me there's no longer a need for the Republican Party because it was put together for things that no longer exist of people who had very disparate goals and objectives. Um, it's probably better they stay together than they, they hang separately. But uh, it's you can come together with people for stuff, but to go around and have as your goal unity with all other people is not the thing. If you don't have unity within a family or unity within a church family, um, how can you have unity with all these other people as well. <coughs> because all those other people I don't have to spend a lot of time with. I only can see them on times when it's mutually convenient for the two of us. So we can say, oh, we're unified. It's more like an affair than a family. And um, the idea is of the universal church, yeah, it's there. Uh, God does view the whole body of Christ. But the emphasis on the New Testament are individual groups of believers, not denominations, not you know massive ecumenical movements. Bill, do you think people get confused kind of um, between the idea of having unity and peace because there are verses that talk about like having peace with all, you know, beyond just the local body. Do you think that concept gets confused? Like if my relationship with somebody else is not always peaceful and pleasant, then we're not unified, or you know. And that's yeah, that would be a command. The command for peace, as as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Uh, when it says, let the peace of God rule your hearts, it's actually talking about people in the church. <laughs> Having a relationship with someone, and usually verses like that about reconciling and come out of the Sermon on the Mount, was originally given to people that were kind of monolithic in their beliefs. But yeah, that would be good to you know, live, do what's honorably in the sight of all men. Peter's got that. So you want to have peace where you can have peace. Mm -hmm. But most of the commands are geared for the people that you interact with. And I guess you could call co-workers... You know, that would fit up that category, um, even though they probably don't believe in Christ. So I have another question. In terms of like Satan counterfeiting uh, unity, so like how can we be on guard against that verse that I can't remember exactly where it is, keeping up teachers or keeping up people that agree with what we say? And Second Timothy using, 4. Thank you. And using that as a basis of unity as opposed to like real biblical unity. Um, because... If you bring the scripture into the equation, it will normally explode any of those things. Because it's, you know, you find a group of people who have gathered to themselves teachers who tell them what to, who want to hear. Paul's solution to that to Timothy was 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Timbo, all the scriptures are given by God, are inspired by God, and are profitable in four areas. Um, what are they? Teaching, Teaching or doctrine, yeah. What's the next one? Reproof. Reproof, showing you where you're off, away from that, departing from that. Next one? Correction. Correction, showing you how to get back on the path. And training, training righteous. So, what's the next piece? That, the men or women of God, would thoroughly equipped for what? Every good work. Wait, were we created to do good works? So the scriptures make us adequate to do every good work. Then, unfortunately, I have a chapter division, but you know, people need to remember to look through those to the rest of the letter, because Paul didn't stop there. Then Paul says, okay, Tim, I just told you that God's word makes you equipped for every good work and how it can do that. Now, preach the word. I charge you to do this before Christ is appearing, who's going to judge you for doing it or not doing it. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season, when it's convenient and when it's not in be, oh, they're not ready to hear that yet. <laughs> Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all patience, endurance, long-suffering, and doctrine. 
Why do I need that? Well, because the time's going to come when they're not going to listen to the silent doctrine. They're going to want to find teachers that will tickle their ears. But you know what you've learned, you've sort of continue doing that. And then he says, I, I'm going to get rewarded because I've done that, and you should too, Tim. So bringing the scriptures in to prevent that, um, one of the best ways to uh, do that is, or the best, um, I'm not sure if it's best because you'll probably get some blowback, but you talk about God judging saints who don't behave. Oh, that is, <laughs> makes the, them go wild. Um, and I read something uh, recently uh, on that and I thought, wow, yeah, that's good. You don't, you don't often see that. It's a good question. Quick clarifying on the, sure. the old chiseling and the rocks. So rocks end up looking exactly the same. Um, and obviously we're different by design and play different functions. So what's the balance between unity and uniformity? Okay, rocks actually don't look exactly the same if you, we have to take you out to a castle or a tower. I mean, or like the Parthenon, you know, the little stone, but look exactly. But they've got, they got big ones, they got little ones, okay. they got decorative ones, they got small mm -hmm. ones, they got buttresses that support it. There's like all kinds of different things. But you bring up a very good question. So, uh, unity versus uniformity. Uniformity generally centers around likes. Unity centers around function, the, you know, the, the body. Uh, and I think I actually have a thing on that, so let's see what the magic outline has to say next. <laughs> um, it's, it's coming up after that, so let me do this gotcha. first. Let me, we'll come back to that chat at the end, because that's a good one. Anything wrong with, let's say, let's agree to be unified on the important stuff. Let's agree to disagree on the other stuff. Why not? You ought to be able to determine the will of God in all things. Ah, so God has a will. We should figure out what it is. If he said it, all scripture is profitable, all scripture is inspired, uh, what does God have to say on the issue? So I would argue, no, actually I wouldn't argue, I try to avoid arguing on, on this particular issue, but I would say that the biblical position is we should be unified on all the things that God has told us to be unified on, not just the stuff that we think is important. But if I say that, I just, you know, the conversation kind of ends, which sometimes is my objective. <laughs> um, it's, you know, if God has said it, it's something we should agree on. So normally people want to have unity only on the things that they like. They don't want to have unity in the stuff they don't. So, uh, the 2000, the year 2000, that was like 15 years ago, we had a spring retreat. Uh, that was like right down here. And there was an outline that I gave in a reference. I couldn't find it. I had four points that I think were worthwhile. Um, we are to walk in unity as we follow Christ to glory. It comes out of Ephesians 4, starts with, walk worthy of the calling which, which you have received, and it talks about being patient and long-suffering, bearing with one another, love, and all that other stuff. Walk worthy. God's called us to glory. We need to be worthy of it. God is infinitely just. He doesn't give unworthy people things that they don't deserve. He always gives us what we deserve, except for the full payment of our sin, which was paid for by Christ. But once you pass that, you receive according to what you've done, good or evil. So that's why he says, walk worthy. You might want to think about, if you like another interpretation, come up with one. Um, two, we build unity as we're equipped to minister and build the body. So he gave the early church gifted men, apostles, prophets, blah, 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 to equip the saints for the work of ministry so they can build up the body. And we defined it. We, it's always been our definition, learning the truth, living the truth, and loving others with the truth. You can't do the loving others with the truth if you don't live it because that means you don't own it and you can't own it unless you learn it. Hence the need for Bible study. And it's re really great to hear people saying it, applying more, what does this really mean in their quiet times? The original readers of the scriptures knew what an imperative was. We miss that frequently in English. They knew it was a command and they paid attention to it. We just say, oh, here's that and gloss over it. So you need to actually be able to recognize those things. And very few translations um, bring out the full force of the imperatives. It's kind of hard to do in English. So we need to learn it, live it, love others with it. Then, this is the rest of chapter four, we maintain that unity. It doesn't end with we build it one another in love. We basically need to maintain the unity as we walk in light of a renewed mind and new habits for the benefit of others. And all that stuff at the end of chapter 4 of Ephesians, let him who steals steal no longer but work with his hands that he might have to share, all that stuff, um, are basically 
put off the self-centered behavior and put on the new other-centered behavior. Put off, put on, and here's why. Um, don't grieve the spirit, uh, cooperate with them because we're members of one another. So that's really the, uh, chapter four is great. Quick review of the news has been teaching reveals surprises for those who basically look at things from the world's perspective. You can't have laws common denominators and stuff like that. So a few verses on this that now follow. Um, Ephesians 4, with humility, lowliness, and gentleness. Uh, that's really the word for willing to be. Uh, it's meekness, willing to be afflicted for uh, suffering with others. Long-suffering, macrothumia, patience, bearing with one another, putting up with one another in love. I always kind of like that. It's like <laughs> love for most people is doing what makes you feel good. Bear with one another in love. In the process of endeavoring, love is not the end in itself, to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then he talks about being the gift of men given until we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and the mature man who's not going to be deceived by Satan's tricks. So uh, Satan's going to come in and disrupt unity. You saw this one, Philippians 127. Philippians actually does a lot of unity verses. I want to hear that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We looked at John 17, 21. Uh, you know, I've looked at John 17, you know, 30 years or so, 30 times, you know, at least 30 times, more than 30 times, 50 times. And uh, there's still stuff in there that is really complex. Actually, a lot of John is like that, so I don't look at it that frequently. <laughs> Um, so I'd encourage you guys to uh, spend some time. We, we used to pray through John 17 at each um, retreat. Then it suddenly dawned on me, I think people only understand about four of these verses. <laughs> so let's dispense with it and do something else. So early church, took a little spot back there. Um, they were all with one accord in one place. And this is uh, before the day of Pentecost. Then after the day of Pentecost, 432, those who believed were of one heart and one soul. They all had one, things in common. Um, and then there's a bunch of other times that he talks about them being of one accord. Does anybody know what, what an accord is? One voice. Possibly. Accord, yeah. That's, that's strange. <laughs> it's, I think it's talking about tug of war, right? It, it, they were all playing tug of war. One voice, yes, one voice, because with one mind, one voice, you're supposed to glorify God. But there's a bigger, richer meaning behind this. Purpose? Okay, there's another word for purpose. This is a word for anger, wrath. So they were all equally angry. Uh... It's also the word for passion. They had one consuming passion. And what was that? Chocolate. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. Give me back my chocolate. <laughs> that, that one consuming passion was to glorify God. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Uh, they also had a passion to be like-minded with each other. Uh, they had a passion for unity. They were all with one accord in one place listening to the apostles' teaching. It was the, the passion that consumed them to learn what God had so they could respond to it. And that was the church that turned the world upside down via the process of getting persecuted and martyred. But that's, that wasn't said there. Paul wants people, and these next verses I think are really unique, not unique, important, uh, fulfill my joy, be like-minded, having the same love for one another, being of one accord, there's our passion thing, of one mind. What gets repeated twice? Mind. In Greek, it's still mind. They're thinking along the same path. Um, I've re observed in my relationship with Jill that over the years, we tend to start looking at things the same way, and we can start, you know, finishing sentences, knowing what the others are going to say, because we have the same mind on stuff. And, you know, you guys with roommates have had roommates for a while, you kind of know what, uh, he or she's not going to like that. How do you know that? They didn't say they didn't like it. Well, because, you know, we're paying attention. So uh, they would like that. 
and uh, you know, people hear about birthday gifts that are given, oh, it's just what they want, yeah. Because people have thought through what's going on in the other mind. We come to the same mind. If we have the mind of Christ, we have the same mind in us. Let this mind be in you, he tells them in Philippians 2 after this, that was also in Christ Jesus, emptied himself to do the Father's will for the future glory. And if I think there's other mind that he says in chapter 3, God will make that clear to you. So, you know, each the list of mind let esteem others better than yourselves. Yeah, it's all a mental process. You really got to be transformed by the renewal of your mind to succeed in the Christian life. Romans 12, a passage on spiritual gifts, be the same mind to one another. And 1 Corinthians 1.10 is the easiest passage to see the um, extent of this. And it's easy for you to remember because it's like, you know, right at the chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians and it's got a 10. So it's like, you know, the numbers are easy. It's a great verse. Um, he says to this diverse, sinful, self-centered, arrogant, hypocritical body of believers that are God's people in a church, that they should all speak the same thing. There should be no divisions among you, but you should be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's not groupthink, although it looks like groupthink, but notice the same judgment they've actually evaluated, considered, what does God have to say, what's the best way to apply that, and then they form that judgment, this is the way we will go. That's the standard of unity that God wants for his people. It's a very, very hard thing to get. Why? Well, if everyone had the mind of Christ, it would be easy. But if people aren't heaven-bent on getting the mind of Christ in their life, they can't be have this kind of unity with others. Any other thing is going to be like, okay, we should all wear the same shorts or the same you know, uh, color. Uh, that, that's uniformity, not unity. Well, it's actually, though, a good thing when we here in this body have people that think differently than we do. We should change our mind about that and actually look forward to working out those divisions so that we have a chance to be perfectly joined together. Because none of us here in this room are exactly alike or have no divisions. So when there are those opportunities, instead of looking at them and saying, okay, I'm just not going to deal with that or with that person, but to use that as an opportunity to work things that are out that are hard. Right, but people run away from the things that are hard and people, and I agree with you, Paula, we should do that. But it is a hard thing and people and have to engage. And the timing of it and knowing when to bring it up, that's also an art. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we're all here in the same room, so. Oh, good, we must be unified. <laughs> so, I know there's a historic example of some business mongrel in the 1900s who was locked a whole bunch of business leaders into a room and said, you're not coming out until you sign something. Uh, and forcing them to be of one mind by blackmailing them, by locking them in the room. Uh, obviously, that's not the means by which we as Christians ought to come to sharing one mind. So we firmly agree in the goal, but what's that process of disunity to harmony look like appropriately? Okay, it, there's, one of the things that you keep seeing here is humility. There's a, you know, I have students that you know, are asking questions because they want to learn, and students are asking questions because they want to debate and maintain their same position. So we have people in a body who ask questions because they want to learn, and you know, what is what is God saying in this because I really want to do it, versus what does God say on this? I want to find a fault, some fault with your understanding of it so I can continue to do what I'm doing. It's the thing we talked about holding something with an open hand so God can take it. And then I said, you really want to be sure about something? Turn the hand upside down, see if it sticks, and then shake it a couple times. <laughs> and if it's still there after you have denied yourself and sacrificed yourself, then you have a good idea that it might be from God, and then you have a much greater chance for unity. So we, we need to plan and have an agenda, and we need to be open to the fact that that might not be God's agenda, which we discover as we interact with other people. Yes? So we talk about none of the bodies are corporate, right? So we, I think, as a church, it's easy to, you know, we have unity in this, like we glorify God, all these things, like big corporate decisions. How about my personal decisions? Does, say, if I have some important decision to make, do I have to get unified, everyone has to know what I'm making, like, that you have the same answer, or do I have as a personal, it's my, I, 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 okay, 
So the question is, if, what about a personal decision that you have to get everyone to buy in on it or what? And um, there are some people who will want to control things beyond what they should. There are others who want to prevent people from walking off cliffs. So in a body, let's go to the New Testament, Acts the passage writes up here. Nobody believed that anything that they had was theirs. <coughs> That's an amazing thought. Very contradictory to our American mentality. Uh, a follower of Christ, the number one first thing was you deny yourself, and then you follow. And, and people would sell their houses and you know, go to the apostles and say, um, you know, there are all these people that have come here to worship in Jerusalem. They uh, don't have any place to stay. They don't have money. Um, we'll give our house literally. Now, we're not advocating that. That is not a command. That's not nowhere in the scripture does it further say. There's a verse that says, "Jesus, sell everything you have and follow me." But First Peter, First Timothy six, help the rich use their wealth, is the you know one of the more final words on that, and it says you should use it for God's purposes. He gives us all things richly to enjoy. It doesn't say get rid of it. Proverbs says there's food and you know wine and falling to the rich, so they didn't give up everything. They're so wise people. But there's decisions that people make that can affect the body, and there's a command to be submitted to the body in its function. So, you know, BAC has been hallmarked by a laissez-faire attitude, but occasionally people want to get worth and value from manipulating others' lives, and that gets bad. But by and large, um, people should welcome the um, input <coughs> of folks who are filled with the Word of God. Colossians 3.16 Let the Word of Christ or God dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another. So the prerequisite for having this kind of unity is the Word of God dwelling in you. And there's also a thing that goes on the side is people can be deceived. We're deceived by our desire. Our desire blinds us to so much. I have gotten an incredible amount of insight out of uh, spending some good time understanding Adam and Eve. It's right in the beginning of the book. It's the, the thing that says, this is why you're in the mess that you're in. <laughs> there are lessons here for people to learn. And the reason I spend so much time there is because I frequently relate so much truth back to that. What caused Eve to cause us all the problems that we've had? Desire for wisdom of God. Desire for good, things that look good on the outside. What was wrong with that desire? Yeah. Went against what, right. Desire was wrong because God gave her those desires. But what was wrong? Shortcut. Yeah, the shortcut. But the reason she did want to tempted by that shortcut is because she wasn't mindful of what God had said. And what we frequently do is decide, oh, I don't remember that. Or we had a gal who left her husband who said, oh, God wants me to be happy. This guy's not making me happy. And she found some other incredible slime ball to you know, say, he's going to make me happy. And she, she left a really nice house in a nice town to live in a trailer park with this guy. <laughs> it's just, he was going to make her happy. It, it's, it's, it's tragic. So people can be deceived, deceived by desire, blinded by desire. Um, I did a series one summer on deadly desires. I'm not sure it's on the web, but it's, a, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Those things kill you folks. Don't, you know, Make sure those desires are, you know, in line with God's desire for you, and things will you'll live happily ever after. Uh, the next verse, John, James three sixteen, where envy, self seeking, there it is, self seeking, it results in confusion and every other evil thing. Uh, wisdom from above, that's demonic wisdom. Wisdom from above, God's wisdom is pure, peaceful, gentle, willing to be, willing to yield. Full of mercy and good truths. Not far from that hypocrisy. Okay, I'm almost out of time. In it. Um, so we saw Acts had the idea, Paul had the idea, Peter had the idea, be of one mind, love his brothers, blah, blah, blah. Um, and how should unities of non, uh, how should issues of non-unity be resolved by talking out according to truth and love? So I got some other things, how should you relate in the context of the local church? Uh, these are questions. I don't know if they're going to answer the next one in the series, but you guys can figure that out if you're interested. And if you're not, I don't want to talk about it. So, uh, <laughs> you know, 
the most of you are equipped to build up yourself, and a number of you are equipped, and you are doing this. You're building up the body. So, if you think it's important, you continue to look. I just, you know, there's a spot for it. So, unity is important. We want to work on it. We want to be intent on one purpose: glorifying God by doing what He said. And that's our that's our purpose for being a church. We want to bring God glory, and we're going to do that by doing what He said. And that shouldn't be that difficult, except for the fact that Satan comes in and messes it up repeatedly. So uh, let's pray and then work on lunch. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have purposes for us that are infinitely good beyond our comprehension and understanding. Uh, we've never seen, nor heard, nor can we even apprehend in our mind what you have prepared for those who love you. Thank you that you have told us what to do. Uh, in our pursuit of loving you. Uh, thank you that you've given us uh, real life uh, places where we can work that out in terms of other members of the body. Uh, thank you for the examples we have in this body of people who love you and love others so that you are glorified. We pray that uh, next time we meet back here, we would have uh, many more praises like this of what you have done in terms of building up your body for your glory. And I pray that we would be living lives of daily praise and weekly praise as well as every six months praise, uh, because you are the God who is worthy of the praise. <coughs> Pray you bless the rest of our time down here. Keep us safe. Uh, thanks again for the privilege of being your children and part of your body. In Christ's name we pray and thank you for our food. Amen.